Progressive depth gauges. There's two competing theories for this. They're both different. I really don't want to talk about this, so we're going to try and speed run it. This is Carlton B3EP. Carlton invented this idea. Let's go with his chain while we're doing it. Fundamentally, the very basics of his theory was that the working corner or the leading edge of the cutter will rise a different amount the further it is away from its rear pivot point, which is this rear rivet. For the purpose of what I'm about to do, the measurements aren't important for this at this stage. All you need to know is if the dial indicator is turning clockwise, that means the, the corner is rising with the input that I'm giving it. If it stays neutral, we're in the dead zone. If it starts going anti-clockwise, it means it's falling. So at the front, if we pivot the back, give it a bit of a rock, you can see on that initial movement, it moves up. We go all the way to the rear of the cutter and we do the same thing. I'll anchor the rear and I, on that initial movement, the gauge goes anti-clockwise. At that stage, it is falling. I have marked a small line on this, which is directly in line in the rear with the rear rivet. This should be approximately the dead zone. So on that initial movement, still rising slightly, but that'll be the ball of the dial indicator moving forward on the top of the two. But for the most part, that's its dead zone. So that was a problem Carlton identified. To give a very basic example of this, imagine the two points down here as different ends of the cutter. That's it when it's new, that's it when it's old. My thumb and finger back here are being the pivot point, which is that rear rivet. If I put a certain amount of input into this, you can see this end has raised further than this end. That's what you're trying to compensate for. That's what Carlton's theory was on. Just a basic leverage of that. Now his solution to that was a gauge that had a forward reference point. It sat behind this cutter and used that as a reference point. Now I predominantly focused on the requirement to lower the depth gauge in relation to the amount of rise this cutter has. So that's their theory. There is a competing theory that come along much later in the early 2000s in relation to in the way to setting depth gauges in relation to a specific attack angle. Different types of aggressive gauges can do this. Right, so to do this in theory, I'm not going to do it actually on camera because it's a pain in the ass getting everything positioned. You need a fixed input. For this, I actually use a constant gauge because I thought it was funny. Um, Put a fixed input under the front of the cutter, you measure the amount of rise to the very tip. So you're looking for the difference between when it's sitting stationary and when it's lifted. So for this chain, this Carlton chain, it starts life with a 0.79 mil depth gauge. To keep that relation for the, the cutter to rise that same amount at the end of life, its total depth gauge it needs the depth gauge to be lowered an additional 0.91 of a millimetre at that stage. So its overall depth gauge height at the rear would have to be 1.7 millimetres. Now, there is some pretty key differences between Carlton chains, especially of that era. When we're talking you need to get stuff made before about 2007 and a lot of chains you can buy now. Just to give you the rough numbers, if you buy Oregon EXL, the difference in the amount that it rises from the beginning to the end of its life is 0.11 millimetres. The chain starts with approximately a de with a depth gauge of approximately 0.61. By the end of its life, its depth gauge needs to be 0.72. So that's the amount of a difference needed in a depth gauge height to keep the relation of the amount of rise of the working corner or the leading edge there in relation to the depth gauge height to comply with Carlton's theory. That's how it, it would work on one of them. So the difference there is only very small. I can only do this on chains that I have new. I don't want to spend too long doing it, so I'm not going to do them all. If we look at C85, the difference is 0.24 of a millimetre. It starts life with a 0.48 mil and it needs to go to 0.71 not big differences. So there's a few factors that get involved in this. The amount of top plate clearance angle a cutter has, the overall design of the depth gauge, the overall length of the tooth. So all chains are slightly different. 
Um, so it's going to come down to what you use. I'll also quickly touch on realistically the types of gauges that are used. Probably the most commonly used ones out there in two-in-ones these days. Um, did a bit of asking around. So especially amongst the tree service guys, like your arborists, your climbers, um, they're predominantly using two-in-ones mostly because they're not the people that control the sharpening a lot of their time. If you're halfway up a tree and you need something sharpened, you either get a new one from the truck, which was generally done on a grinder and set in whatever way they do back there. But for the most part, they want their guys to be able to sharpen on the job. They use two-in-ones because a ground guy can give you a chain that's exactly the same as what you would create. So it's quite commonly done. People still involved in the forestry industry now that I've got some info from and people, a couple of guys that own a sawmill, they do a lot of falling and they are chasing depth gauge heights by feel. They are not using a gauge. They have a feel that they're going for. Uh, the most common response was if it cuts, it cuts. If it doesn't, make it cut, which is pretty basic. My most commonly used depth gauge tool is just a flat file. If you are new to this, use a tool. There's a big price to be paid if you get this wrong. Use a tool, use whatever type of tool you like. More experienced people will generally be chasing that feel, as I described. You know when you get it wrong, you'll know when it's right. But it's not advice that I can give to someone who's new at this. Um, so yeah, like I said, if you're new at this, use a tool. Do whatever makes you happy. That's the basics of the theory. So there's two separate theories. The important thing to keep in mind is there's two separate theories on pro progressive depth gauges. Both work slightly differently. From my own general experience, the Carlton theory worked. Honestly, it, it's about right. You just need to know how to apply it to the chain that you're using, the style of cutting that you're doing. The other thing I'd like to talk about briefly The biggest effect of this comes at the end of life. You will notice the biggest effect pretty much by the time that chain is starting to approach that rear rivet. So anywhere from there back is where you're gonna notice the biggest difference, which is about the last third of a chain's life. However, depending on your style of cutting, the size of your saw and the chain you're using, you need to be very realistic about how much life you're gonna get at the end. While this chain doesn't have any witness marks, most do these days. If they give you a witness mark there, I tend to find that the chains, will, that the cutters will bend or break off before they approach that point. This is due to my cutting style of generally using larger saws with short bars and hardwood. So there's more feed pressure involved for me. So the chains are under a lot of load and it does go wrong. I have broken top plates off um, uh, quite a bit sooner at the halfway point in the past when I was trying different things, trying to get um, a lot more aggressive on some of this stuff. The other thing to keep in mind, the change in the depth gauge will change the reaction feel, that you, the, the forces that you feel. You don't want a chain that just beats you up. You want something that you can actually run for the day. What you will find if you look around a lot of chains from people that are running, running saws all day, they're using a much higher depth gauge setting than you would think because they're looking for something without that big reaction force. They don't want the saw chattering or pulling them in or pushing them back whenever they're cutting. If you're looking from a purely cut speed perspective, the majority of race chains run extremely high depth gauges. This is because the operator can generally control the feed better than the chain can. So you're looking for a chain that has the right amount of depth gauge that it will pull itself but you want to be able to lean on it to control it. So if it starts dying down, your releasing pressure will bring the RPM back up. Whereas if the chain's pulling itself down to the point of pulling the RPM of the saw down, you can't, it's much harder to control that. So yeah, that's some of the basics of this. Um, it's not really a topic I've got much interest in anymore, to be honest. I have tried both styles, different things. You can generally make it work. The pieces of advice that I, I did a couple of short videos uh, a few months ago, one of them, which is oddly one of the most disliked videos I've ever done, involved shaping it. So my advice is to shape it. The big issue you can run into with any type of gauge is ending up with a large flat section on the chain. What will happen as that initial rock happens, the leading edge of the depth gauge will impact the wood. At that stage, it reacts like it has a significantly higher depth gauge than it actually has. 
The other problem with that of leaving, leaving a square point on the front is the chain tends to react like it has in a very aggressive depth gauge. Remember the way this, the cutter clears the bottom of the kerf, it's not a perfectly level surface. There's a lot of little ridges and bumps in it because it's torn out a piece of wood. If you leave a square edge on the front there, that starts impacting everything. You'll start getting a lot of chatter and bad feedback to, back to you. And to you, it feels like your depth gauge is too low. I see that very commonly, especially amongst people using two-in-one gauges. Um, because they're not following up. Uh, guys using progressive plates end up with the same thing. The only advantage they've got is there's generally enough angle in that gauge down to clear that front edge, but it doesn't hurt to round it to remove it. So yeah, that's uh, hopefully me done with this. I have a bunch of videos that I may or may not release at some stage of testing this. For the most part, the actual difference you get is not that significant and isn't that significant if you've properly maintained your depth gauges to begin with if you just leave that large flat section on the front and you were to compare it uh if you this was all the way back and you left that as one large flat section from using this style of gauge you've just run flat the whole time and then you move to this style of gauge you'll see a big difference due to the shaping of the front so yeah that's the basics of it. Hopefully I never have to touch on this one. Hopefully I never touch on this one again, because yeah, I think I'm done with it. Hopefully it wasn't too boring.